So a very warm welcome to you all, interested members of the public and my colleagues in the academy. It is my pleasure to open this, our third symposium of spring 2021 on behalf of my colleagues on the Indian Ocean Working Group Organizing Committee, Dr. Rogaya Abushara, Dr. Uday Chandra, Dr. Virat Uruch, and Dr. Amira Sonball. Last year, my colleague, Dr. Uruch, a professor of literature here in Georgetown, Qatar, convened the Indian Ocean Working Group's very fast webinar titled Indian Ocean Humanities, Current State, Future Directions. During that webinar, one of our audience members, Anurag Khan, a student of history in India, posed a question to the panel on how best scholars could approach and tackle the histories of pirates in the Indian Ocean world. Khan had in mind pirate activity in past centuries, for example, that of Portuguese pirates in the 16th or 17th century. Following that webinar, the question he posed remained with me because as a scholar of East African history and an East African myself, the much more recent phenomenon of Somali pirates in the Horn of Africa was foremost in my mind. Away from the often breathless and sensationalized news reports on their activities, it has been evident to many observers that there are a complex range of issues that triggered piracy in the region in the second decade of the 21st century. Today, we return to the Western Indian Ocean, specifically the Horn of Africa, for a presentation and discussion on piracy in Somalia, violence and development in the Horn of Africa, based on a book of the same title that Dr. Alec Walder Michael had published recently. The moderator of the webinar is Qatar University Professor of Security Studies, Dr. Afiare Elmi, who has joined us in past Indian Ocean World related events here at Georgetown in Doha. Dr. Elmi is faculty at Qatar University's Gulf Studies Program. He has a PhD in interdisciplinary studies, specializing in political science from the University of Alberta in Canada. His research interests include peace building, governance and security studies in the Gulf and East Africa. Dr. Elmi has been the lead principal investigator of the piracy in the Horn of Africa project. He is also the author of the book, Understanding the Somalia Conflagration, published by Future Press. And he has authored or co-authored more than 30 academic and policy studies. Besides more than 20 open articles in leading newspapers and media outlets, Dr. Elmi has provided commentaries to the New York Times, BBC, and Al Jazeera. Dr. Elmi will now proceed to introduce our guest speaker, and he will also moderate the Q&A session later. Dr. Elmi, welcome. Thank you very much, Professor Phoebe Musandu. Uh, and thank you very much for the group that has put together this uh, interesting, uh, I mean, session. Uh, I also welcome Professor Awed Weldmichael. Uh, professor Awed Weldmichael is a professor and national scholar at Queen's University in Canada. He is a member of Royal Society of Canada, College of New Scholars. He is an expert of the Horn of Africa history and politics about which he regularly speaks on international media and Twitter that is, by the way, his newly discovered favorite medium. <laughs> Professor Wald Michael has authored several journal articles and books, including most recently book, which is Piracy in Somalia. I can tell you, and I can actually testify that this is one of the best books on the subject. I have read it uh, and 
I would encourage uh, for those people who are interested to read, uh, Professor Awet Waldemichael, please welcome. You have about 30 minutes and then uh, we will just follow up with questions and answers. Thank you. <clears throat> I am delighted to be uh, uh, joining you virtually today. And uh, thank you very much, uh, my uh, dear friend, uh, Phoebe Musandu. Um, just an uh, important disclaimer that we were talking off the record earlier uh, that um, Phoebe and I um, went to the same graduate school, although I was several years ahead of her. Um, and uh, thank you also, um, Professor Afira Almi for that um, favorable, for that pleasant introduction and uh, for your constant uh, support and constructive critique always. Um, the topic of my discussion is uh, my book. And uh, what I'll do is I'll share some slides with you um, that around, around which my discussion uh, will uh, uh, evolve or uh, revolve. And I will focus on three um, um, items. One is why the phenomenon of predatory piracy in Somalia. The second is uh, a commentary on the evolution of uh, international maritime law as it pertains to Somalia. And, uh, and finally, um, I will try to tackle the fallacy that piracy was beneficial, hence attractive, and the deterrent the deterrence to it would be uh, raising the cost of um, pir piratical activities. So bear with me as I share my slides. Um, um, the incidences of piracy, a lot of people attach it to the failed, quote unquote, failed state uh, of Somalia. And, um, but that discourse that the failed Somali state is the uh, reason that piracy erupted um, fails to explain the numerical uh, incidences or the numbers that can be countered as piracy. So to begin with, the Somali state collapsed in January, 1991. In 1994, there were many incidences um, and the uh, leading uh, Somali piracy scholar, um, Stig Hansen of uh, Oslo uh, University uh, speaks of how there were more piratical incidents in Italian waters than there were in Somali waters in this period until 1994. And then between 1994 and 2004, the whole decade when there was a slight uptick in the incidences of piracy, there, is, there are a total of just under 200 incidents. Um, and not all of these are piratical because in some instances, there are false alarms. But then in the subsequent decade between 2005 and 2015, we have more than a thousand incidences of, of piracy. So the question is, if the failed Somali state was at the heart of piracy. How can we explain the fact that piracy was remained insignificant for the first decade and a half? The explanation is that, or what I contend in this book is that the, the state failure in Somalia contributed to piracy only to the extent that it failed to prevent foreign illegal fishing in Somali waters. And I focus on foreign uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing in Somali waters, not as the principal, but as one of the principal causes for the eruption of uh, piracy, which quickly then evolved into predatory ransom piracy from what existed before as a defensive, almost as a knee jerk impromptu response of fishermen uh, against this industrial scale looting of uh, their uh, maritime resources. And so, but then the, the, the illegal fishing boats started to come heavily armed to a point that 
the disorganized impromptu defensive pirates, quote unquote, um, were outgunned, were defeated until in 2005 with deliberate criminal intent. Pirates were reorganized and started to attack every moving ship that they could find um, with the intent of collecting ransom and not defend the waters. That is not to say that similar criminal uh, activities did not happen in the earlier decade, but the numbers that it happened were so small that one could not speak of uh, predatory piracy in Somalia before 2005. Now, this leads me to the question of IUU fishing as being a reason uh, for Somali piracy or at the root cause of Somali piracy. It's important to take note of the fact that um, IUU fishing was not unique to Somalia. In fact, IUU fishing uh, is still a global problem. A dated uh, research from more than a decade ago, estimated that, actually two research uh, outputs, estimated that globally, IUU fishing costs anywhere between 10 and $24 billion annually. And the estimate goes on that Africa loses about a billion dollars annually. This was more than a decade ago. This estimate was more than a decade ago. And of this billion dollar that Africa loses to foreign illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, Somalia's share was estimated by, um, by a Colorado-based uh, research and think tank group to be upwards of 300 million per year. So this global phenomenon costing more than $300 million a year to Somali fishermen is not a small uh, loss. The environmental damage uh, is also incalculable and I don't have the expertise to speak to that, but that is something that awaits to be done. This happening in broad daylight um, right in front of their coastal waters um, was an affront to Somali fishermen who may not have consumed the fish themselves, but depended on fish as a source of uh, income to support themselves and their families. Now, the question of IUU fishing in Somali waters is contested um, on the basis of the fact that Somalia did not claim its territorial waters or that Somalia had uh, a 1972 uh, claim to 200 uh, nautical miles, which is unacceptable by existing international maritime law as, as stated in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS of 1982. Here, um, I, I uh, borrow a lot, or at least my delving into this topic was inspired by an excellent article um, that Afira Elmi co-authored with uh, my other friend um, and uh, his research collaborator, Laden Afi, um, also at Qatar University, who was at that time at Qatar University, on the history of uh, maritime law in Somalia. Let me now move on to, or I've already now moved on to the second key item. Um, this is to just show you, um, I'm moving back to my slide to show you how in 2004 was the height of Somali commercial fishing. And then these are sample of three companies. The majority of them had collapsed. But after 2004, we see a dramatic drop. And by the time I finished my research, they had not recovered. And I'm going back on the slide to see the dates now. Up to 2004, look at the minimal incidences. Um, and so 
there is a correlation is what I'm trying to say. And my research on the ground across Puntland uh, confirmed this correlation to also be causation. Um, now, I've, I've moved on to the second topic of my uh, research um, or of my presentation, which is the maritime law aspect. Um, in 1960, the United Nations convened the second um, um, convention on the law of the sea or the UNCLOS II um, to discuss outstanding issues from that that were not resolved in 1958 during UNCLOS I. And this was the breadth of um, the territorial waters of countries. And this was contested or they could not reach a resolution because a growing number of Southern, of global Southern countries from Asia to Africa to Latin America had become members of the United Nations and they vigorously uh, advocated for a larger um, territorial waters, which um, major uh, maritime countries in the world, maritime and industrial countries of the world were not uh, uh, agreeing to. And this, is, this has to do more with the newly independent countries uh, feeling the need to claim or assert their rights over the, their, the maritime resources in their adjacent waters, whereas uh, industrial um, maritime, large maritime countries or distant water fishing nations wanted a growing access to littoral uh, waters of the global Southern countries. This leads um, earlier on to the um, la three Latin American countries um, agreeing to up to 200 nautical miles um, as territorial waters, which was not entered into United Nations records until the mid 1970s, but it became a precedent for the African Union or then Organization of African uh, uh, African organ, OAU Organization of African uh, Unity in 1971 to decide that African countries should claim as large territorial waters as possible. And Somalia as a leading country in these discussions was among the first countries to follow through on the resolution of OAU foreign ministers. And in 1972, Somalia claimed to 200 nautical miles as territorial sea. But subsequently, um, the United Nations convened UNCLOS three, the discussions for which lasted about a decade. And when it concluded in 1982, African, Asian and Latin American countries had or squeezed some concessions from industrial large countries whereby 12 nautical miles were considered territorial waters where countries could exercise sovereignty and an additional 200 nautical miles as exclusive economic zone. Um, and Somalia was an active negotiator in these debates and was one of the earliest countries to sign UNCLOS in 1982. Somalia ratified UNCLOS in 1989, but by then it was deep in uh, the civil war and the government collapsed in 1991, in January, 1991. So there wasn't follow through. Somali state weakness did not enable it to follow through with these uh, ratifications. But in terms of legality, Somalia's rights to its territorial waters and EEZ were established not only in its ratification of the existing laws, but the 1958 UNCLOS conventions or the, the four Geneva conventions um, agreed on an important principle called the up initial doctrine, which is that the territorial water and EEZ rights of countries are, are immediately 
um, available to these countries, they do not depend on claims by these countries. UNCLOS does make, does place an expectation on these countries to make their claims known. But the ab initio doctrine is not superseded by UNCLOS to the best of my understanding. So as far as international maritime law is considered, concerned, the 1972 Somalia claim was rendered superfluous or redundant by Somalia's signing of UNCLOS in 1982 and its ratification in 1989. This is a convenient uh, legal wrinkle, I call it, um, that some scholars and business interests, especially those benefiting from exploitation of lucrative Somali waters hide behind to say that Somalia did not lay proper claim to its territorial waters. So foreign fishing in Somali waters is not necessarily illegal, which is total nonsense. Now, let me move on to the next, to the third and final point of my discussion, which is that the reason Somali piracy exploded um, this is a claim that many present, was that um, there was a high return to investment. In other words, a limited amount of investment would generate windfall profits in the, in the hundreds of thousands and later in the millions. Um, to the few in criminally uh, minded investors in this criminal enterprise, and mind you, I do not deem piracy as illegal. It is a criminal enterprise which responds to a larger crime of foreign uh, IUU fishing in Somali waters. Coming back to this rationalization or argument that windfall profits is what makes piracy a viable option to many, um, it is viable to the investors. But let me show you the figures uh, and what they mean to the individual pirates that sail out in small boats and capture these vessels. At the height of successful pirate incidents, there was a 41% success rate. But the success rate was significantly lower in the years prior and in the years uh, after 2008, 2009. And let me show you the gap between the successful incident and the failed or the reported incidents. And these are graphs and these figures are in my book, by the way. So um, let's move to here, 111 reported incidents and 46 confirmed captures. And I want to focus on the gap between these, okay? Most of times, these are one-way tickets to, 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 to capture or to face the risk of being captured or simply disappearing. The, the, the chances of pirates making it back home upon failing to capture a, a vessel was, was, was very slim. So there are very few incidents of pirates who spend days or weeks out in the, in the ocean and make it back safely um, upon failing to capture something. So their predatory uh, enterprise was typically a one-way ticket. And when they are captured by uh, the international navies, that in fact was a welcome rescue. It was not just captivity. This is from several pirates that I spoke with also, is confirmed by several pirates that I spoke with also. And so, and in the, in the whole period when piracy was a huge phenomenon in Somali waters, there were roughly 
about 1,100 Somalis captured in various prisons around the world. So you have these numbers and these failed incidents. You deduct 1,000, 1,100 who were captured, who were accounted for. The remaining numbers are staggering numbers of losses or deaths in the sea. This is one. The second one is that when pirates capture a ship, they are on rickety small boat and climbing several feet higher, a big ship on unreliable, unsteady ladders, which are risky in and of themselves. Um, there are reports of some pirates dying, trying to climb up uh, big vessels. So what I'm trying to say is that the windfall profits may be high to the investors who for the most part stayed on coast, on shore. But the cost to the individual pirates who attacked these vessels, these mostly innocent vessels, I must emphasize, the cost is life or death. But the reason that most foreign scholars tend to argue that it's the high profit margin that entices pirates to go is simply because the lives of black bodies who happen to also be Muslim are not taken into consideration and the whole enterprise is simply monetized and the lives of Somali pirates however criminal that their act is not taken properly into consideration, which I find to be unconscionable. These are the three main points I wanted to make and I'd be happy to take your uh, questions. But before I do, uh, or your comments and your critiques, before I do, I just wanted to show also the, the faces um, and, and experiences of innocent, uh, commercial uh, sailors who found themselves captive to this criminal enterprise. And these are sailors of MV Iceberg that was captured by pirates and held for ransom for just under three years. And this is, I like to show this picture because I was in these waters and I was in proxy talks to the pirate who captured these pirates to the, these sailors, I'm sorry, um, to, to, to release them just a few weeks before they were rescued by Puntland Marine Police Force. And um, when I pressured the pirate linchpin through a proxy that there is no money coming uh, to rescue or to, 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 to ransom these sailors after more than two and a half years of captivity and that it would be, um, a humane thing to do to release them. Um, his response was straightforward and curt, said he himself is captive to his investors. So showing you the complexity of this criminal enterprise. Um, a few weeks after I left um, Gara'ad, uh, which is where uh, these, the area between uh, Gara'ad and Ail, uh, not specifically Garad. Um, the Puntland Marine Police Force raided this ship and freed the sailors, the pirates fled. Finally, in spite of um, the international up, uh, uh, attention to illegal fishing and uh, piracy, illegal fishing uh, was alive during piracy but came back with vengeance after piracy ended, which then brings us to the question of what, what was piracy beneficial or not? Well, piracy was not beneficial to the Somalis, but to some degree, piracy did scare away foreign illegal fishing. And that's why immediately after the end of Somali ransom piracy, we see um, the return of foreign illegal fishing to Somali waters. And Ethi Al Amal is just one of these examples. I can 
give others uh, during Q&A. Let me stop here. I'm not sure if I have uh, reached my time, but I'll stop here and take uh, questions and listen to your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Aweb. Actually, this is a fascinating presentation. Uh, and uh, I have some questions, but I wanna see first uh, who are uh, interested in asking questions. Okay, while people actually, uh, while we wait uh, people to just ask questions, I, will, I'll ha I have two questions. Number one, and what happened? Oh, sorry. I, I hope I haven't lost you. Yeah. No, I can, I can hear you. I can see you. Okay. Uh, actually, my first question is about the impact of piracy uh, in Somalia, particularly, because a lot of the studies uh, we have seen talk about uh, the other impacts that it has on global trade, it has on, uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, people who have been uh, captured and, and, and kept uh, an impact on uh, uh, other countries, the economic, the whatever it is, security and all of these things. But often neglected is the impact that piracy has had uh, on Somalia. So that is uh, my first question. My second question actually is, and, uh, and actually I know the book has a lot of examples and uh, discussions on this, is what were the uh, contributions that Somalis have made in order to end or contain piracy? I think these were the two areas that I thought your book was quite strong and your book actually discussed it on uh, so I would like uh, to give you the floor again to discuss uh, this bit more. Thank you, thank you, Afiere. Um, these are these are very important questions. And um, on the first question of impact of piracy to Somalis themselves, I wrote a whole report that Dalhousie University published as a report, and then um, a summary of that report is published in this book as a chapter. And the impact has been very, very grave. Um, this, this, is not, this is not to take away the impact that piracy had on, first of all, on the innocent sailors that found themselves hostage, and definitely on the global economy that many uh, uh, research projects uh, elaborated on. So we're not talking in competition. Um, but what, what I am saying is that well, don't forget the impact that piracy had on Somalis as well. So let's briefly see what these, what these are. First, wherever Somali pirates went, they brought insecurity because they themselves were heavily armed and they did not hesitate to use it against each other and against their local community, even where they are from. So um, pirates from Gara'ad, did not hesitate to use violence against residents of Garad, in spite of the many local um, uh, mechanisms to prevent them from doing that. But then these pirate hubs, whether it's Garad, Ail, or, or uh, the areas uh, around Bosaso, um, also were places where non-locals came. They were truly Somali cosmopolitan areas. So there were pirates who had no clan or family or other ties to the local communities, which gave them more freedom or less strings to use violence against their host communities. And there, they also um, negatively impacted the moral code of a, of a religious community in this area. The majority, nearly 99% of uh, Somalis are Muslims. And the majority of them are practicing Muslims too. They're not just nominal Muslims. Um, and in these coastal communities of devout Muslims, alcohol became very widely sprayed, spread. 
alcohol is prohibited in Islam. Um, and it was widely spread at a prohibitive cost as well. Um, the consumption of chat or qad or qad, uh, which is this mildly narcotic leaf that grows uh, in Kenya and Ethiopia and also uh, in Yemen, um, became so widely spread and the literacy to the economy and health and moral values of the society. Um, pirates started to become bad examples to the children of coastal communities. Um, prostitution spread very widely in areas where pirates uh, arrived. Um, economically, pirates caused a lot of economic damage or um, made it expensive for coastal communities to live in their own villages. And here's the, the logic. A pirate leader would want uh, supplies, water, food, or whatever, and they may not have the money to pay for it right away, but they have a ship and hostages close by waiting for ransom or in the midst of negotiation. So they would offer these shopkeepers double the price when ransom is paid. And so a bottle of water would would cost a dollar normally, uh, a pirate would buy it for $2, would borrow it for $2. And the coastal small shops would not need their money right away because they only go to the big cities once a month or once two months, by which time negotiations would have ended and they would have collected their $2 per bottle that they lent the pirates. Why would then these shopkeepers continue to sell the same product for a dollar to the coastal communities when they could sell it for double the price to the pirates who oftentimes offer to double the price, okay? The effect of this was the immediate doubling of basic consumer goods in coastal areas. So the combination of this which, had, which were devastating to the coastal communities are in fact the ones that compelled coastal communities to organize against pirates, which is the second point that Afiere raised. Um, so their moral values undermined, their, 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 their children uh, having bad examples in their midst, their day-to-day -day livelihoods or econo household economics undermined or made prohibitively uh, impossible, all of these combine to, for, for, for these coastal communities to organize against pirates. And in fact, I believe these proved to be far more important in dissuading pirates from going to the sea. And those who were not dissuaded were physically forced out of these coastal communities um, uh, by, by uh, threat of violence from their own communities. And those who claim to be, I am local too, were told you're local only if you abide local laws. And this, I set an excellent example um, to all coastal communities by doing this. And then Garad quickly followed Ail's example. And they were, they were unashamed or unabashed unafraid to say, Ail set a good example in doing this. We have to do what Ail did, and they successfully did so. Thank you. Uh, there are actually a few questions here, and, and uh, I would like to give uh, the opportunity to ask. Uh, I have a question from Mubarak, Brandon, Jennifer, and Zakaria. Uh, if anyone of you wants to ask, uh, uh, you can go ahead. Otherwise, I can read it. Okay, so uh, let me start with. Uh, has anyone stepped in? No. Let me start with the question that uh, Mubarak asks. And he says, could we say the legitima sorry, the legalization of fighting Somali piracy has led to an increase in illegal fishing 
in Somali territorial waters. So that's one question that Mubarak asks. Mubarak is from International Islamic University of Malaysia. Uh, Brenda Novel uh, asks also a question. Uh, how important has been the United Arab Emirates financial and technical support to the Buntulan Maritime Police Force? Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about, I think here the, the question is about in terms of ending the uh, piracy in, in Buntulan area. Uh, so that's the second question. Uh, so uh, what do you want to, to respond to the first two questions and then I'll come back to the other two? Yes, um, to Mubarak's uh, point regarding the uh, legalization of fight in Somali piracy. Ironically, uh, yes, uh, the fighting of uh, piracy um, left an important gap or came with an important gap or loophole that did not include the policing of Somali waters against foreign IUU fishing. And so um, this gap is made worse by the fact that Somali state's capacity to police its waters did not grow in tandem with these legal frameworks that gave international navies the right to enter Somali waters in pursuit of pirates or on counter piracy missions. These very ships that were conducting anti-piracy missions did not have the mandate to, to stop or to deter foreign illegal fishing. In fact, in several famous instance, instances, I don't know if to call them famous or notorious instances, um, these international anti-piracy flotilla served to protect foreign illegal fishing or what would be considered foreign illegal fishing had there been an effective country policing its waters. So yes, I, ironically, and unfortunately, uh, the fighting of Somali piracy um, did uh, uh, increase the chances of foreign illegal fishing to resume and resume with vengeance in Somali waters. Now, to the question that Brendan um, is raising, um, the United Arab Emirates who was a very important backer of Puntland, and there were a lot of controversy surrounding this issue. Um, um, the, 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 the personality of uh, Eric Prince, uh, the Blackwater uh, private security company personality um, who was contracted, who then subcontracted South African security, private security companies, all of them with checkered histories but in the end, what defined or what remained important was to what end was Puntland using such resources? And here I, I must give credit more than anyone else to uh, then president of Puntland, uh, now an elder, elderly Somali statesman, uh, Mohammed Farole, Mahmoud uh, Farole, who was very serious in fighting piracy and meticulously put uh, the resources that were generated or the support that came to the purpose that it was intended. And when he lost elections, when he lost, when he stepped out uh, of, of the stepped down from presidency, he passed on all those resources to the subsequent president. Um, and we can talk about the successes and failures of the subsequent administrations. But these, these forces, whether it's Eric Prince's, Eric Prince's at that time was, were called Sterling uh, Security or his subcontracted South African uh, uh, security trainers, um, including the salary and uh, uh, equipment of the Puntland police force, which numbers about a thousand well-trained, well-armed uh, security um, force were uh, financed by the United Arab Emirates and was put to effective use to um, supporting the community efforts that I talked about earlier. And very recently they have been active in in fact chasing 
uh, the few cases of Somali pirates going out to the waters and capturing uh, vessels in which they simply surround the vessel telling the pirates they needed to come off or there is no way that they are sailing with the captured vessel. So yes, UAE proved useful and Puntland put it to effective use. Okay, and uh, thank you, Awet. Uh, I have two more questions from the, from the uh, question uh, part here. Where were the illegal fishing boats from? Which countries? That's the question from Jennifer. And then here we have another one from Zakaria. Uh, Zakaria Abu asks, how important is Somalia's current legal case in the ICJ in terms of achieving and asserting its maritime borders and reaping the benefits? And actually there is another one uh, here. Uh, Barakad Mabratu. And this question is Oh, it's just actually a general comment. I don't see a question here. So go ahead and you can respond to those questions. Okay, um, to Jennifer's question as to uh, origin of the countries um, where IEU fishers came from. Um, unfortunately, let us let me first make an important disclaimer or repeat what I said earlier, which is that um, IUU fishing is a global problem and um, its sources come from many countries, especially from distant water fishing nations. These are maritime countries with highly advanced fisheries sector that are also highly subsidized by those countries. And the lion's share of those subsidies goes to improving the fishing capacity of these uh, uh, vessels. And this fishing capacity is already very, very advanced. So when a lion's share about more than 40% of the subsidies go into improving their capacity, you are encouraging them to go further and further um, into global waters uh, and uh, waters of vulnerable countries uh, like Somalia uh, to, to plunder basically. Um, so in the case of Somalia, we have cases of um, European fishing vessels, um, whether French, Spanish, uh, or Italian, to um, East Asian from uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, to uh, Thai uh, and, and uh, others. And, and immediately in the region, in the Arabian Gulf, we have numerous Yemeni and Iranian DAOs. So the, the scale or the capacity of Yemeni and Iranian DAOs is not the same as um, um, Taiwanese or Korean um, uh, vessels or, or Spanish vessels. But what they do not have in individual capacity, they have in large numbers. Because when they come, they come in dozens, in some cases up to more than 100 vessels at a time. And the, all of these fishing vessels are not only illegal by their presence where they should not be, but they're also illegal in their methods. Um, there are also credible reports that African vessels are also uh, involved in uh, uh, illegal fishing in Somali waters. Again, the illegality has several uh, uh, levels. One is not only being where you should not have been without proper documentation or proper licensing, and two, fishing for species that you're not supposed to fish, and um, fishing with equipment that are not allowed. Um, so it's a global phenomenon at so many levels. Um, the subsequent question is from, um, I lost the question. I don't know if uh, Sakaria- It's about the, the current IC, ICJ rule. ICJ uh, case. Yes. Right. Um, well, the current ICJ uh, um, dispute um, between Somalia and Kenya. Well, it's no longer between Somalia and Kenya because Kenya has withdrawn from ICJ uh, on the eve of ICJ finally hearing the case after several postponements. And that's really unfortunate um, because 
Kenya and Somalia have a lot uh, in common and a lot to share than uh, the, the area that is in dispute and um, that they had to go to ICJ is unfortunate and that Kenya, um, uh, a, a democratic country uh, that lives by the rule of law um, chose to walk away from a court of law um, is also unfortunate. But this is of little, in my understanding, of little uh, consequence to the question of piracy and uh, uh, IUU fishing um, and is more relevant to underwater or under seabed resources that um, the two countries have given overlapping uh, concessions, exploratory concessions for oil and other underwater resources. Um, but the sliver of overlapping areas also have maritime other uh, fisheries resources that can be relevant, but are not significant in that regard. And, and this is to the best of my knowledge. And then um, Afire Barakat has a, a, a question toward the end, which is that what is the implication mm -hmm. of piracy to the wider Horn of Africa? Well, yes, go ahead, the please. First, yeah. The first implication yeah, ahead, is yeah. that, okay, thank you. The first implication mm -hmm. is that um, resources that belong to the Horn of Africa are plundered um, and the environment um, is compromised. And, and this, is, this is not just relevant to Somalia or the specific coastal communities where this happens. It affects the entire coastal area from as far south as Mozambique and as far north as uh, the mid Red Sea region. And so this is this plundering and environmental degradation is relevant to the entirety of the region. Second, the piracy, the criminal piracy um, undermines the security of the entire maritime route in the area. And this is one of the most strategic waterways in the world, which gives significant strategic significance to the Horn of Africa. The maritime choke point at Bab el Mandeb is globally strategic. And the fact that it's compromised uh, by security threats that Somali pirates pose negatively affects these coastal countries that benefit from this maritime uh, traffic. Um, finally, and, and these are not isolated incidents, many cases of pirate, cap of pirate captivity involve um, vessels loaded to the brim with flammable gases and oil and other um, uh, hazardous materials. If any of this were to go aground or to explode in the hands of pirates or be attacked by maritime terrorists, the entire maritime habitat of the whole region would be compromised. So the significance of piracy, what, it, what caused it and what follows it are far reaching than simply Somali waters or Somalia itself or the specific region that it happens. And it should be relevant, not only to coastal countries along the Horn of Africa, but beyond that. And perhaps finally, um, the Horn of Africa, because of its geostrategic significance, and also because of the heightened significance of the Indian Ocean to global powers, um, piracy has given an excuse to further militarize an already vulnerable, an already delicate uh, geopolitical and, and, and security space in the Horn of Africa. Okay, and I have again another question actually to ask. Uh, as far as I can see, I, I, I don't see any hands up at the moment. Uh, what, and there are still uh, international uh, militaries uh, NATO and others uh, still involved in counter piracy operations, and they are still justifying uh, their presence in the Western Indian Ocean and Red Sea that uh, Somalia's piracy is just, I mean, contain it, but not eliminate it. 
Uh, what is your take to that? Um, yes. Let me step back and, uh, uh, and relate the story of how these foreign um, um, anti-piracy uh, navies came to Somali waters. It started in 2007 when pirates started to attack uh, WFP, World Food Program vessels that were bringing in relief aid to, to Somalia. And upon, um, I think, two vessels being attacked and subsequent vessels either refusing to transport relief aid or demanding exorbitant prices because the insurance premiums had to go up, um, WFP through uh, its threw hands up in the air and saying, unless the international community is prepared to protect us, we would not be able to deliver much needed aid uh, to starving um, uh, Somali communities. And that was a legitimate request. And at that point, starting in 2007, NATO started to uh, send in uh, warships that escorted WFP vessels. Subsequently, as especially as maritime piracy, uh, as, as ransom piracy intensified, um, the United Nations Security Council um, sanctioned or passed a resolution inviting any country that has the interest and the capacity to fight um, uh, pirates off the coast of Somalia to send in its resources for the purpose, but to get the green light from the Somali state. Somalia by now had established the transitional government very weak and depended on the largesse and goodwill of Western donors. So it may not have had the capacity to say no, just as it did not have the capacity to monitor its own waters. And, but still from a legal or legitimacy point of view, foreign navies coming to Somali waters had to get the green light from Mogadishu, which was a pro forma request. And so you see a number of countries sending in their vessels individually or through coalitions. And it's within this context that we see NATO's presence multiplying, not just escorting WFP vessels, but actively uh, coming to monitor, chase, capture, and bring to justice uh, pirates. And we also see uh, European Union sending in its coalition vessels in addition to individual countries, as I said. Um, several of those navies or missions wrapped up um, uh, a few years ago as piracy declined. But what I'm trying to say here is that their presence there served some deterrent function. But I cannot say they were completely successful uh, or they were the silver bullet to Somali piracy. Um, because the pirates organized and launched from land. And when they captured ships, they brought them to the coastal waters without which they could not have operated. And that is what Somali communities deprived them, at least in Puntland, which I did the bulk of my field work, Somali communities from coast to coast to coast denied them that. And I give more credit to, um, to these coastal deterrence, coastal mobilization, more than maritime uh, monitoring and apprehension. Because at the height of this international maritime presence in Somali waters, a total of 30 to 32 vessels was the height of their presence. That would mean a total of less than 30 patrol vessels monitoring the entirety of the United States. So they are insignificant in terms of size and coverage, in terms of their presence, in terms of their numbers, and the area that they had to cover, they were insignificant. Do they serve some deterrent function? Yes, they do. And so is their presence uh, justified? 
Partially, yes. Partially, because the threat of piracy still looms large. So the Somali state is still weak. It's not the state, but to begin with, that stop piracy. It is the communities. These international navies, individually, individual na national navies or coalitions have not been effective in coordinating or supporting these community initiatives. There is embedded distrust between the two. Um, but we have to ask a fundamental question. Were they there solely to fight piracy is an important question that ought to be asked. And this has to be answered in the context of the global rivalry over the Indian Ocean in general and the Western Indian Ocean region, the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea in particular. There are additional motives to why these global powers are sending their navies, not just pirates. Thank you. I have two more questions here. Uh, Barakat actually asks, uh, do you believe piracy has an impact on democracy in the Horn of Africa? And Ladan Afi uh, here asks another question, which is uh, what has been the role of women in the whole piracy project? Um, I am not sure what Barakat means by the role of uh, piracy on democracy. Um, I, I, I think if I may clarify that, I think what, might, what it might mean, I don't know exactly, but I, I remember one time when we were writing about it, the pirates, uh, by pirates were trying to exploit the nascent democratic institutions in Somalia and in Puntla and in other places. I guess that's maybe what, what he means. Yeah. Um, well, ransom piracy, as I know it, is a criminal enterprise. It's an organized crime. And um, as an organized crime, it took advantage of any and every opportunity that came its way. And the, the electoral process in Puntland seemed to benefit some pirate groups because there were rumors swirling that these pirates funded that presidential candidate that then led to other group of pirates funding or propping up another, another uh, presidential candidate in the second round. Or I, I think that is, there is a lot of um, uh, mischaracterization here and criminalization of all Somali actors is at play here. Um, to the extent that I know, um, the majority of Somali uh, uh, politicians, the ones that I know and I can vouch for, um, did not benefit from piracy. In fact, many of them did fight it and fought it vigorously. So this notion uh, uh, of, of um, making all presidents or presidential contenders or office holders criminal. And I'm not trying to say that some were not involved or some were not distantly uh, related to pirates. And this is where pirates proved very manipulative and adept at exploiting such opportunities. Um, and the clan structure also did help them. But I see a bigger um, thing at play towering uh, Somali initiatives and um, Somali successes is at play here. And this, this tarring or uh, besmirching exercise, unfortunately, is not just done by foreigners against Somalis, but also done by Somalis amongst themselves to discredit one another or delegitimize one another. But all of that benefited the pirates because like I said, um, as organized criminal enterprise, it proved a lot more adept at exploiting opportunities, had no contribution whatsoever to the economic well-being of the society, nor the security or democratic vibrancy of uh, their, their regions or the country at large. And then the question of Laden. Uh, Laden, so good to see you. Uh, um, the role of women, and, and 
I, I saw a tweet by a colleague who works on organized crime on whether uh, women are involved in organized crime. And, and here's the interesting part. Yes, women are participants of various to various degrees in the criminal enterprise. And so I know of Somali women um, who invested in piracy um, and, and who collaborated with pirates after a captured ship uh, came uh, to coast. The interesting part is that the flip side of it was also spearheaded by women, which is that the fight, the, the fight that coastal communities waged against pirates was in fact spearheaded by Somali women. Um, and the role of Somali women is a lot more prominent in the counter piracy initiatives than in the criminal enterprise. Because there weren't Somali pirate leaders, women pirate leaders, or there weren't Somali uh, most successful or leading invest uh, women investors in piracy. Although there were some who benefited or who um, sold drugs or uh, uh, in prostitution uh, or sex work uh, rings and what have you. The role of Somali women in fighting pirates, however, is least documented and least celebrated, but most decisive. And, and here's why. The majority of small stores and food vendors along the coastal areas on which pirates depended are run by Somali women. And these were the frontline fighters who said, we are not lending to pirates. We are no longer doing business with pirates. So what's the point of having a massive industrial scale shift on the coast if you cannot feed not only the hostages, but your, your own entourage of shahat or uh, dependents, beggars, as they call them, right? And they could not do that without borrowing from the coastal towns, uh, business people, the majority of whom were women. And there were women who lent initially to these pirates at that double price that I mentioned earlier. But as soon as the negative impact of this piracy emerged, they said, we're not doing business with you. End of story. They went beyond that. Somali women organizations were on the forefront of mobilizing popular support in these coastal areas. Again, from as, as far north as uh, Alula uh, to as far south as Gara'ad, which is the area where I, I, I did uh, field work, Somali women mobilized elders religious leaders, youth groups, and also protected their own children to not deal or not come close to pirates. And so the role of Somali women is, was absolutely crucial. Unfortunately, has not yet been fully documented. I tried to the extent that I could to do it some justice in my work, but unfortunately I fell far short and I hope someone um, could do that. Okay, Awad, I have uh, a question from Dr. Saeed Yassin. Uh, did piracy reduce the plundering of Somalia's maritime resources by other nations? So that is a question. To some degree, I believe it did. I believe it did, but I am cautious in saying this because in the first instance, we do not know the full extent of foreign IUU fishing or foreign illegal fishing in Somali waters. Um, for example, we do not know the exploitation of industrial scale vessels in Somalia's exclusive economic zone. We know that it existed, but we do not know the extent of it. But to the extent that we know, um, we see a pattern of reduced incidence of foreign IOU fishing at the height of piracy. And we see the intensification or intensified presence of foreign illegal fishing operations in Somali waters when piracy declined. 
And so that correlation is too good to ignore and say, and I would dare say, yes, pirates as criminal as that enterprise may be, serve the deterrent function that a weak state would serve, that even a weak state would serve. And their disappearance or their defeat or the, 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 the ebb of piracy um, is mashed by the flow of illegal fishing precisely because of that. And thank you very much, Owet. Uh, I don't see any other question at the moment, but I wanted to ask again, by the way, I'm moderating, so I'll just abuse my role here. And as you know, there are uh, about 1,100 attacks of which 300 or so have been successful. And Somali pirates have collected uh, actually an estimate of about $500 million, uh, which has more or less uh, criminalized the whole Somali economy. So like whenever you see anybody uh, building a big, a nice building in Nairobi, then people would expect, you know, uh, speculate, this is from a piracy money or this or that. So that is actually a, an, an interesting thing. One of the biggest impact uh, piracy or Somali pirates had had on, on Somalia was this branding of uh, Somalia as a whole as pirates. So I just wanted to ask you this question. Uh, while you were doing this research, and particularly outside Somalia, uh, what was your experience? We had our own interesting experiences, you know, uh, when we talked to non-Somalis, uh, some of them even uh, suspecting that all Somalis, regardless of whether whatever profession they are in, have somehow uh, uh, relational I mean, or, or they are related to the pirates. So what was your impact? I'm sure, I'm sure you have had some stories there. <laughs> yes, I've uh, far too many stories to relate um, <laughs> uh, in, a, in a limited time that we have. Uh, yeah. But uh, there are several misconceptions. Um, let, me, let me start with um, historic Somali entrepreneurship historic Somali entrepreneurship that was um, suppressed and displaced by the civil war and subsequent instability across most of Somalia, with the exception of Somaliland that quickly uh, recovered from the war devastation and created a predictable, stable system um, sustained by uh, Somali by a combination of Somalilander interests, including business people. Second in, in that succession was Puntland. <clears throat> Puntland quickly <clears throat> replicated Somaliland's experience and created the Puntland state, which is the blueprint to the federal system that is highly contested right now, as we speak, Afiere uh, and Laden, you know this uh, as much, perhaps more than I do. Um, and what happened was as soon as a semblance of stability was restored, uh, Somalis, um, and in this case, Somalilanders will have to forgive me, um, I will include, uh, uh, include Somaliland in the wider Somalia region. As soon as semblance of law and order were restored, Somalis returned home with investments with ideas, with capital, okay? And uh, wherever you see a semblance of a stability, you see a revival of this historic Somali entrepreneurship. Some of that coincided with the incidences of piracy that is the subject of this, of this book, of this discussion. But mind you, between 2005 and 2012, we're talking about seven years of piracy, of predatory ransom piracy. The fact that you are characterizing this long history of vibrant entrepreneurship of the Somali people 
on the basis of a seven year experience shows you how little you know the society and its history. That's a bunch of horse shit, excuse my language. And I've, I've read several reports like treasure mapped and all sorts of things that use nifty high end technology to map infrastructural and electrification and other activities, all of it is linked to piracy money. That is methodologically flawed, factually inaccurate, complete nonsense that capitalize global interest and concern, honestly, about the maritime insecurity that pervaded the, three year, the seven years that is the subject of, the, of discussion here. But this is not to say that piracy was not criminal. And this is not to deny that these criminal enterprise generated millions of dollars that you mentioned. But these millions of dollars that were generated through this criminal ransoming of innocent sailors, not all of it found its way to Somalia. Number one, these figures are speculative, are speculative ballpark figures, the specifics of which I spoke to many pirate leaders. The numbers that they have and the numbers that their accountants give me and the numbers that are internationally reported are not consistent, which that's the nature of the beast. But that makes you doubt or take these millions of dollars with a grain of salt. They are at best estimates. We do not know how much of that is retained in Abu Dhabi, in London and Nairobi as negotiation cost, as facilitation cost, as commission or whatever that the people in between charged. And they charged progressively higher. That's one. And the amount that went into Somalia did not go to a single pocket in that large numbers for that money to be whisked out. There was an investment scheme. A person coming in just in alone would have a share. A person coming with an RPG-5 would have another share. A person who first climbs or gets on board a ship is rewarded with a share. So what I'm trying to say is that the amount of money that is dumped or that is airdropped aboard a ship or wire transferred when it was possible to do so early on trickles down to the pyramid of investment which included monetary investment on the initial mission or equipment or in-person presence of uh, the pirates, okay? So this is very important to take note of because the individual pirates who would collect anywhere between 5,000 to 100 plus thousand would have borrowed a lot of money before they managed to collect their ransom for seeds. And automatically, the money that they have already borrowed is paid before their, their, their share is, is, is uh, given to them. And each pirate is followed by a few, up to a dozen um, supporters or dependents, locally called shahat in Somalia. They do not consume this money alone. And many of the foot soldiers of piracy that I interviewed would tell me that they went bust within weeks of receiving tens of thousands of uh, dollars in ransom. And the few pirates, pirate investors who collected large enough sums to make impact in local markets did not Openly invested, many of them hid it. So, there Brock, was you that have another question. You, there is Sorry. another question someone uh, wants to ask. So, go ahead, conclude that one, and then 
I will give Ladan the floor. So there was, I'm sure you've come across the claim that Eastly uh, real estate boom was um, a direct result of the piracy money flooding into Kenya. That simply does not make any sense and it does not take into consideration the amount of wealth that Somalis generally have and their entrepreneurship generates. So I am not ruling out the possibility that one or another pirate or pirate money was invested in real estate in, in Nairobi, but as important economy as Nairobi being fueled by Somali ransom money over a seven year period simply does not take into account Somali entrepreneurship and Kenyan economic vibrancy. Okay. Afere, I'll stop here. Uh, there is actually uh, someone who has a hand up I, as far as I am aware of. Ladan, do you have any question, anything, any concern, any comment? Um, Awed, thank you so much. Uh, this was so interesting. And it took me back a few years because I haven't been doing this piracy project. Uh, it's been six years now, right, Afiere? Um, but I, I just wanted to point out that I think the importance of your book and your research is that you did go to Somalia and that you did do the research there and that you did talk to Somalis. Whereas a lot of the writings, not just on piracy, but other um, issues relating to Somalia, people don't set foot in Somalia and often are talking to people who know very little about Somalia. So I, I really appreciate um, the efforts. I don't know how long you were in Somalia. I'm sure it wasn't very easy <laughs> to do research uh, there, but um, I think this is an amazing contribution to Somali studies. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Ladan, very much. Um, yes, I traveled to Somalia uh, between six and seven years. Um, and uh, it was it was challenging. Uh, it was thrilling and definitely rewarding. Uh, but financially, it was ridiculously expensive. Um, and I did not have uh, enough financial uh, research grants. And so I had to borrow from my own money. I had to use my own money for the bulk of my uh, research. That, that broke me financially, uh, but in terms of intellectual, social, cultural um, connection with Somalia and understanding the reality on the ground, it gave me a unique perspective um, that many researchers unfortunately were not fortunate enough to have. Um, and yes, it has been, my book only came uh, a year and a half uh, ago, but in the past few months, I've been so consumed by the conflict in Ethiopia that erupted four months ago, but I was following it more closely, even longer than that. And so coming back to this project, uh, Dr. Masun Musandu and uh, Almi, I really thank you for bringing me back uh, to my uh, old stomping ground because the past few months have been totally consumed by the civil war in Ethiopia. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Professor uh, Old Michael. This is uh, an interesting book, as I mentioned. I read it and I really enjoy it. And I uh, really encourage uh, for those people who are interested in the Western Indian Ocean or maritime security, or non-traditional maritime security threats, I would really encourage them to read that book. Uh, I, I, I agree with Ladan that this is written, uh, taking into account the perspectives of the Somalis. And I think that's very important. And I really appreciate that. I want to give uh, back to Professor Bibi uh, Muzandu, uh, so she will conclude the session. Thank you so very much. This discussion and the presentation was as interesting as I had hoped it would be. So my thanks to Dr. Welde Michael for joining us here today. And we really could not have done better than have Dr. Elmi as the moderator for this session. So this was like a, a dream team 
<laughs> and I'm so glad that we were able to put this together. Thanks also to our audience. You helped us expand the discussion. You, know, you brought in the gender aspect, investment, democracy. Some of these, I have to say, you know, Awit has um, touched on in his book, but you, know, you also helped us bring it out in perhaps larger detail that could have come out in, in his presentation. So thank you very much to the audience for joining us here today. And then I'd also like to thank Heidi Malkas. You can't see Heidi Malkas, but she's with us. She's been with us from the start of this session. Heidi Malkas is the event manager at Georgetown. I can say without equivocation that she runs a very efficient event team and they transitioned us so well into the pandemic, you know? And so my thanks to her and for being here and also being our backup tech person as well. And then I'd also like to thank uh, Kata Foundation. So if you know something about Kata and Education City, you know that it's um, an initiative of this country's uh, Kata Foundation. So we'd like to thank Kata Foundation and through Kata Foundation, Georgetown University in Kata for uh, supporting our initiatives as the Indian Ocean Working Group for uh, a number of years now. Uh, when we could meet in person in Doha, they have funded us and provided all the necessary support. So I must thank Kata Foundation and I must thank um, Georgetown University in Kata. And I should end by thanking Anurag Khan uh, from the session that my colleague, Dr. Pirat Uruch, um, had last year, because that was what triggered this whole idea. So uh, I don't think he was part of today's um, uh, meeting, but you know, I just wanted to acknowledge that question that he put uh, in, the, in the Q and A session of um, last year's session. And I also want to let everyone know that um, in due course, this uh, webinar will be uploaded to um, the institution's Georgetown, uh, Georgetown University in Qatar's um, YouTube channel, and you can find a number of our previous uh, webinars on that channel as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. This was a very enriching discussion and uh, keep coming back. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Fiji. Goodbye. Thank you.